The following is a conversation with Alexander Schwarz, partner at ISD Cube, and Ingrid Kelly Spielman, IP expert also at ISD Cube. In this conversation, we are talking about the European deep tech early stage investment ecosystem and the different organizations of the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Gets Together podcast today with the interesting topic, uh, what is the future of early stage investment in Europe? And I'm very happy that um, partners from uh, the Austrian early stage fund ISD Cube uh, join this conversation and give us their perspective. Welcome to the show, Alexander Schwarz and Ingrid Kelly Spielmann. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to have you here. Maybe I start off with giving a little, a little bit of background uh, to the topic, um, and then we continue with a bit of introduction of ISD Cube and you two. Um, I started in the early stage field in life sciences in 2006, and uh, in my opinion, the ecosystem in Europe was pretty empty. In the preparation for this podcast, I reviewed a little bit what was going on back then in Austria and found a few companies and personalities that still exist today and uh, still operating in the field. One, for example, is Intercell slash Valneva that had its initial public offer in 2005 and is still operating in the field of vaccine development. Uh, Valneva CEO Werner Lanthaler, uh, CFO Werner Lanthaler, so back then, uh, moved then on to Evotech and has uh, built as a CEO Evotech into a great early stage development engine, in my opinion, which is uh, listed in the German index and currently has plans, I guess, to get also a, a second listing on the Nasdaq. Then also in 2005, MarinoMed started, which uh, did an IPO, I think, three or four years ago at the Austrian Stock Exchange. Nabriva, uh, spin out of Novartis. Um, interestingly, the spin out was led by Rodka Novak. He is now a uh, president and co founder of CRISPR Technologies, uh, who's operating in the gene editing. And these are only um, a few examples of uh, companies that started about uh, 15, 16 years ago and uh, still are moving forward. But uh, when I look at the early stage ecosystem that we have right now here in Europe, uh, it has grown tremendously. And still, recently I found a report from the famous consultancy group McKinsey. Uh, and still, this consultancy group points out that there is enough and sufficient room for improvement uh, that we can do. And these topics I would love to discuss with you, Alexander and Ingrid. And maybe you can give the audience your background, where you're coming from. Well, thanks. So my, my background is um, in chemistry. I started chemistry. I studied in Graz and the ETH in Zurich and continued kind of uh, an academic career uh, as a postdoc at Harvard where I worked in many different fields from, from material science, microfluidics, uh, virus inhibition. So I enjoyed a quite uh, broad and wide scientific education. And when I returned to Europe, um, decided against the continuation of the academic track, track for a couple of reasons. I joined, you mentioned them before, the famous McKinsey. Um, I spent there a couple of years, uh, eight years in, in consulting, in the fields of life science, uh, chemistry, energy, so kind of engineering science uh, related topics in strategy and business development, continued thereafter, still with um, smaller companies in, as a consultant. And finally, I kind of found my way back to the beginning, that means to something closer to science at ISD, um, an institute that I was following for from the beginning on essentially. And I'm now part of ISD Cube for, well, it's about three years now that I, that I joined ISD Cube. Thank you, Alexander. Ingrid, what about you? Yeah, so I started out as a molecular biologist. I did a PhD at the University of Cambridge in RNA splicing, not imagining that RNA and mRNA was going to be such a hot topic in <laughs> 2021. 
Um, and I got out of the lab pretty early. So as soon as I'd finished my PhD, I started the training to become a patent attorney. Uh, initially in private practice, and then I switched to a corporate IP department at Novartis in Basel. Um, mm. After some years there and a bit of consulting, I ended up in Austria, in Vienna, the Vienna area. And at that point, I switched a little bit into the technology transfers area, uh, initially at the University of Vienna. So this was a bit of a sideways move, a chance for me to broaden my horizons and find my way back into an academic setting. And three years ago, I made a new move, which was to, to IST Austria and subsequently to IST Cube. So I would say that the last decade or so has been a lot about um, getting a feel for what's happening in academia and seeing how that relates to the startup scene and getting technologies you know, out into the world. That's great. Let's stay a bit... Uh on your organization. So you've mentioned a few terms and uh, let's start with what IST is. Uh, that's uh, above the word cube uh, behind you at the logo. Uh, because I think the time from 2006 to 2009 was not only interesting on the development side, but also on the research side. As far as I remember, the first steps towards the IST happened in the first decade of uh, this century. Can you give a little bit more information on your institution? Yeah, um, so yes, IST was founded in 2009. Um, so we're past the first decade, but still a very, very young institution. And the thinking behind it was that it was, not, it was there was a, a gap in the Austrian academic scene in the sense of a well-funded institution focused on academic research um, of the highest excellence. Um, and this was a vision which was kind of unique at the time, and a lot of people doubted that it would actually work. But now I think at this stage, you know, 10, 11, 12 years later, it's something that's been amazingly fruitful and, and, and successful. So we now have over 50 groups working in different areas of research, ranging from quantum physics to computer science to neuroscience. Um, working in a very interdisciplinary manner, um, all doing blue skies research, so curiosity-driven research, but really at a sort of groundbreaking level. Um, and there's an excellent community here, really excellent minds, but also a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, so in the relatively early days of IST Austria, um, Markus Wanko was recruited to head up the tech transfer function at INC Austria. And I think in part because of his a little bit unusual background coming into tech transfer, he developed a vision for how tech transfer might work um, in discussion with the management at IST to see about how not only the science can develop in an excellent way, but also how the application of the science could look like. And that led to a number of initiatives, including um, what we call twist fellowships, and then ultimately the creation of a specialized tech transfer function within IST called the, the twist office. So we are a subsidiary of IST. Um, we carry out all the usual functions of technology transfer, um, but we have a fair degree of independence in how we operate internally. That's a great explanation. I just was smiling when you were talking about uh, some people might have doubted that uh, that can work. I remember the discussion here in Austria um, about uh, 15 to 20 years ago where people asked, uh, "Can is it sufficient to place uh, 1 billion funding um, at an institution? put it somewhere in the middle of nowhere uh, from the Viennese perspective. Uh, it's a little bit outside of, of Vienna. And this automatically will attract the world's best researchers so that a unique uh, scientific uh, novel ecosystem that has a global reach and global impact uh, can develop. And I think uh, 15 years later, we can clearly answer the question, yes, as far as I remember the articles about the ISD, I think it's amongst the three best and uh, uh, mostly recognized research organizations globally. But please correct me if I'm wrong. No. 
it has been ranked in that there was a size adjusted ranking by nature and there IC Austria made it to number three, which is a spectacular success for an institution that is around for just a little bit more than 10 years. Yeah. Then it was 11 years old. Um, and that is fantastic. But obviously that was not just because you take $1 billion uh, euros and um, a place outside of Vienna, but it was a lot of policy work involved and in how to set it up and to be really committed to excellence from the very beginning on, plus many other things that were important to attract people. And it's really attracting people from all around the world. I mean, at the moment, it's about a thousand people that work here uh, and they come from 70, 80 different nations. So it's really a global thing that's happening here outside of Vienna. And um, from a Viennese perspective, sometimes it seems that this is pretty far away from the city center. <laughs> but if you talk to people that spend commuting one or two hours a day in one direction, in London, in, in New York or somewhere, for them, a, a little bus ride or a bike ride of 20 to 30 minutes is really, I mean, it's, that's nothing, yeah. Yeah, we could joke around a little bit about the Viennese perspective of traveling, basically, I think. Uh, uh, for some Viennese people, traveling to the next uh, district is already a holiday, so it's a holiday trip. Uh, from that, coming from that angle, I said it's a little bit outside of Vienna in the middle of nowhere, but it's uh, basically, I think it's 30 minutes in total, a bus and uh, public transport, so it's basically part of, uh, you say, of Vienna. And I can only invite people to really have a closer look at what's happening at IST and maybe also visit the, the place, the outreach programs. It's a, it's a sensational success, I would say, and it's way not recognized or known among the people as, as it should be. It's really a fantastic thing that should be celebrated and people should come here and visit it and attend the lectures that are given here. That are given here. It's really, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story, actually. Yeah, I absolutely believe that it's one of the success stories in Austria uh, that we can really be proud of. Uh, to have uh, built here, uh, let's say close to Vienna. Um, it, I mean, to me, it looked very logical then the next step to uh, create a tech transfer office, uh, to also look for uh, commercialization possibilities. And um, as far as I got to know the, the deep tech sector in the early stages um, in Europe, mostly it was the game of, um, uh, business angel like founders who enjoyed uh, deep tech, who put their money in and also started the companies. And it's like, for example, Demis Bioscience, Erich Tauber, uh, who licensed uh, the basic technology, the basic technology from Institute Pasteur, started the company, put his own money into the, into the company, uh, grew it up and to a point that it uh, became interesting target for uh, Merck in the United States. Um, what I missed very often here in Austria was early stage VC um, support. And whenever I talked with VCs, uh, I got the answer that they don't really like to, to touch that area. And then IST and uh, um, Twist had the idea to start an early stage organization called IST Cube. Um, and not only put one or two people on it, but uh, create uh, a profound team. Can you give a little bit background about IST Cube, why it was started, what's, what's its position on the market, and what people are working at IST Cube? Yeah, maybe let's let's start again with a little back look to IST Austria. Um, there, the, the 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 blueprint that was created for the for Institute was very much driven by looking at what others are doing, like ETH in Zurich, Max Planck, and, and the Weizmann Institute. So, and, and learning from, from, from the best in that field. Um, and that transpires more or less also what, what happened later on. The idea was not just to have um, individual players here around that, that can support um, companies, startups with money and some, some, some access to people, but look at it in a, in a wider space um, and emulate to some extent what's happening in other successful places in the, in the world where startups can actually thrive. 
Uh, so that means really thinking about multiple players, multiple functions um, that make up an ecosystem. So um, that was kind of within the thinking of IST. And so the idea was, um, so what's missing? There's this, there's this uh, science institution that does a couple of things to identify uh, interesting science projects that have the potential to actually become a startup. There is this twist fellowship that was mentioned. Then ISD Park was actually created, a tech park uh, next door, I mean, really next door, just across the street, and soon to be connected with the bridge. So we really bridge science and business here. Um, and there was another component missing, and that was the access to structured um, capital uh, that goes beyond the, the, um, the abilities of, of individual angels. And that was kind of compl completing the picture of those three components, academic um, excellence on one side, uh, infrastructure with labs and, and, and office space, and then funding in a way that can also support startups. And all three of those parts share as a, the first name, IST, but in fact, these are different, three different um, legal entities and institutions that share some, some, some links, obviously. But IST Cube as a fund is completely independent from, from IST when it comes to decision making. Uh, we see startups from all Austrian academic institutions and we see them all in the same way. So there is, we don't discriminate between IST and others in neither a positive nor negative way. But we are here. IST was extremely helpful at the beginning to, to kick off the fund. It was also one of the initial investors in the fund. So there are links. Um, and through the vicinity to the institute, um, that gives us a number of advantages because we and the startups that work with us, because of the the, the infrastructure here at underground plus access or to an extremely vibrant scientific community and people uh, that that make up this this community. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the people people behind ISD Cube. Um, we have two personalities here in the podcast, but the team is actually bigger. Can you uh, give a little bit background to who's working at IST and uh, a little bit to their roles? Sure, yeah. So we've grown recently, so we're 10 people now. Um, Markus Vanko, as mentioned before, is one of the managing partners, as is Alex, um, as is Florian Resch. Um, and we have two other principals, including myself, uh, in, in addition to myself. So we have uh, Kavita Sorana, who I'll talk a bit more about, and, and Bernard Petermeyer. And I think one of the characteristic things about us is just the diversity. We have such different backgrounds, um, such different professional experiences, that it really means we're complementing each other very well, um, learning from each other, and bringing lots of different things to the table. Um, Alex mentioned he's a chemist, I'm a molecular biologist. Um, Bernhard has a background in mechatronics and um, started a company as a spin out from EPFL in computer science. Uh, Kavita is a climate change scientist and policy researcher um, who has a lot, had a lot to do with um, climate related startups in the US. Um, and Florian has a background in investing um, and a very strong mergers and acquisitions background, etc. So between all of our skills and the financial background of people like Marcus Vanko, <clears throat> we're able to bring a really complete package to the table. Um, and I think we're a very good team. We all, it's very respectful and, and actually really fun to work together. Yeah, and uh, Kavita is also a physicist, physicist. So we have it basically covered the, the most important sciences within the field that we're working in, physics, chemistry, computer science, electronics, and so on. But also we have the functional expertise in terms of, we have a lawyer, we have the business background, we have the IP background, which is extremely helpful. Um, and that enables us basically to do what we want to do, identifying good startups and teams and, and also helping them later on. So you're not bound to any scientific area or any region. So you look uh, at uh, startup ideas or spin-out ideas from uh, all over Europe and uh, from, let's call it all walks of science. 
All works of science, yes, we can basically say that. It's important to have some real scientific core in, in the startups uh, that we work with. When it comes to, to geography, we have a certain focus on Austria. So Austria is certainly the, the starting point where we, we work. So far, our plan is to focus on Austria with some, with some um, outside investments that are going to happen. But for now, I think there's so much to be done in Austria that we will not kind of distribute our energy and also firepower too much outside of Austria. It will happen to some extent, but Austria is for now a real structured um, focus area. No, that's really great what you're doing. Let me give you my uh, simplistic picture of the world of science uh, when I look at the translation from science into products. So on one hand, uh, there is this well-financed area of research and uh, isd for example is uh, i think one of the best examples uh, that this area is really well financed um, you had uh, 10 years to grow into a nice institution and got a lot of public funds uh, that supports that mission that important mission when i look on the other side of the equation on companies that are already listed on uh, the Nasdaq or companies that are close to being listed, or for example, here in Austria, companies like Marinomed um, that I mentioned, Evotech or Timis Bioscience. Later stage companies have also access to uh, capital, to ecosystems, uh, to talent. And my perception was that in between, there is a huge, huge gap. So there is uh, basically, I would call it a no man's land or the value of death uh, that people need to overcome to come from the well-funded and well-established uh, science uh, ecosystem to the well-established and well-funded uh, later stage ecosystems. And usually when I was talking to VCs, I mentioned it already earlier, uh, I got the answer, but just asked, why don't you take up this opportunity? It's there. <laughs> you just have to step into it. Most of them said, no, it's too early. It's too complex. It's, uh, we don't understand it. Um, we love later stage opportunities. And my comment was, but uh, there is no later stage if we don't bridge this gap. And ISDQ, I'm very happy about it because you were the... Uh, one of the few ones who said, no, okay, we see the opportunity, we pick it up. And what I'm interested in, why? Why did you decide that to, to stand out and to go exactly into that field that, in my opinion, is still the most complex field uh, to operate in? Uh, I mean, we, we probably looked at similar statistics that everybody does, that uh, science was increasing tremendously in quality and quantity of output over the last years in, in Austria. Uh, but the, the amount of funding did not follow suit. There, there was not a growth in parallel. And we also didn't see a num the numbers of, of startups go up in, in the same way or to a level that would be expected based, uh, based on the numbers of, of students, of scientists and their output. So and if we, if we want to build up a pipeline of successful companies, we need to start at the beginning, right? And especially the beginning is, is a tough business. I mean, it's, um, it's not easy. The tickets are relatively small. Um, you need to spend quite some significant amount of time with the startups. It's not just, not just signing a check and sending, wiring some money and the rest will happen. But it's really working together in a project that requires a certain team size. It requires a certain amount of uh, experience in the team and ideally, also, um, uh, institutional closeness, like we have it here at IST, that, that helps. Um, so we tried really to, to fill that gap from the beginning on. For one, because we thought it makes sense. There was an opportunity. And also, yeah, not many teams were, were on the start. So it was um, almost an obvious choice uh, to, to give it a try and to, to build a team that was able to actually execute in, in this area. Um, as you mentioned, there is, there is an, in Austria, we have an excellent system for early stage uh, VCs in the sense of there is, there is uh, funding from the, from the public side that is really outstanding that many countries offer similar situations um, and in a way that, that just needs complementing by, by, by private money, by equity that helps the teams to also bridge in the way they operate from, from the funding side to an equity world. 
And we decide to do that. And we, we can do it by how we are set up also financially. You know, the, the initial investments are in the range of a couple of hundred thousand. But then we continue up to a couple of million, three, four million per company. And that's enough to, to bring them pretty far. And we are talking technology-based companies um, that will get additional funding from other investors. We, we, we are not shying away from syndicating for the others. I think it makes a lot of sense. So um, within the Austrian ecosystem, they can easily fund, I'd say, five to 10 millions. That shouldn't be a problem for good ideas. Um, and then we can make them ready for, for bigger rounds where also investors from the outside come. So money is certainly not um, the limiting resource in Austria when it comes to funding of startups. Uh, to add to that, I think it's really all about what kind of impact can we make? And um, as Alex said, I mean, money is one thing, but I actually feel that that's in a way the least important part of the package that we bring because I really see that we are helping startups get off the ground that may never have actually got to that stage without our input. And this is in part because we're actually coming in often even before there is a company. We're starting that dialogue with researchers at a point where they haven't even made a decision about whether to start a company or not. And so in terms of impact, in terms of actually creating the startups and supporting them, getting them through those early difficult months and years, our expertise, our experience, and um, our relationship to those founders, I think is, is already making quite a difference on the scene and is incredibly uh, kind of gratifying for us because we really have the feeling like we're making things happen. And maybe to, to, to take one step back and not just to talk about us, I think the advice to, to founders or founders to be researchers would be there is, I mean, start to talk, start talking to VCs or potential financiers early on. I mean, there is not, not too early, I would say. As soon as there is a certain idea to found something, to spin something off, I mean, look outside the lab for people to discuss this idea. To, to get reinsurance uh, reinsure, uh, that this idea is good or to get maybe input that tells you maybe this is not the right thing, but maybe there is a twist to that that could make it happen and expose yourself to the world outside of the, of the lab and the scientific community to get more ideas and, um, and uh, profit from, the, from different experience from different people. Um, it, we had a couple of times the experience that founders thought it was too early to talk to us because they didn't have a business plan ready yet and, and the product wasn't defined yet. Um, but it's fine. I mean, this is this is part of the development um, process. And in some cases, we, yeah, we, we, we could play this catalytic effect to enable something or maybe um, change the path that things could have taken otherwise and i think and i hope to the to the better actually let's stay a little bit in this uh area and call it uh problematic so there are a few hurdles to solve so uh one you mentioned uh already this is when is the right time to talk to vcs um when is the right time to reach out to, to potential investors? And I completely agree to what you are saying, uh, that the world is full of capital. So it's uh, not really a, a lack of capital, generally speaking. Um, but there are other problems. And one problem that uh, I experienced uh, very often uh, during the process of uh, helping people getting something off the start was uh, mindset, shift in mindset. So looking at academia, I personally perceive academia as a very creative field where people uh, thrive to um, find new ways of doing things that are outside the box, outside the box thinking, and uh, they're basically free to do that. Whenever I look at companies, especially at the bigger corporations, uh, to me, it looks more they have a very focused, very narrow approach and try to make things better, but on a very, very narrow path uh, where you can't look left or right. And uh, bridging over to, to capital, whenever I talked to US uh, VCs, why they don't come to Europe? I mean, there's a lot of science ongoing here and uh, there are teams here. 
then they pointed out that uh, they miss a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit uh, in scientists here in Europe. Can you give us your perception of uh, the differences between the different mindsets, uh, academia, big corporations, and this founding entrepreneurial spirit that you perceived in your work? Um, yeah, perhaps to the mindset of, of, of academic researchers. I think it, there are a lot of aspects of that which can be problematic if thinking about encouraging researchers to, to found a company. Um, one is the feeling that they somehow are not equipped to enter into the startup arena. The feeling that their qualifications equip them only to do academic research. And I think that's quite easy to overcome because we have plenty of role models. We, we have people who have started companies and who have transitioned from being a pure lab academic researcher to being really quite successful early stage founders and have grown enormously and developed new skills and found new strengths and, and so on. Um, I think another thing is the security thing, you know, the feeling for some reason that I don't quite get that academia is secure and startups are not secure. I see academia as a shark tank, basically. Um, very few people on secure permanent contracts, this feeling of, you know, you have to produce in order to progress and publish and, and all the rest. I don't think it's a particularly comfortable environment, but it's an environment that people know. And I think that's the fundamental thing. It's people who haven't been exposed to anything else find it incredibly challenging to step out of that and try something new. And anything that we can do to give people that bit of courage and just step out of their comfort zone can, I think, really deliver benefits on all sides, also for, for personal development of these people, because not everybody can have a successful academic career. The, the, the other thing is that it's in the past, I think it was perceived as kind of a choice between being an academic or starting a company. Um, and we, we believe it's, that's not a choice. I mean, um, if there is a successful professor who is doing her research, they should continue like that. And there is no need to step out of the, of the, of the academic position. Um, but it can still, from this lab, from this group, can a spin-off happen with somebody from the group, a postdoc, a PhD student, actually driving the whole thing. So there, is, there, are, there, are, there are models where the academic person, the, the professor, stays in academia and still enables um, a startup based on the science. So it's not a contradiction anymore. And I think that that's important to recognize, and that was not always like that. Um, and there are models established, there are, it's, it's, it's done, it's been done and, and proven. And yeah, in the US, I mean, 20 years ago, when I was still studying there, everybody was all the time talking about, could we spin off in a company opportunity here and, I, and, and patents there? It was just omnipresent. Everybody was kind of thinking about it at, at an institution that was on, on the top of research and still everybody thinking about startups. So, as a good example that research and startup is not a contradiction at all, but actually one is enabling the other. And it's now also more and more, I think, understood and, and felt in, in Europe, including Austria. But of course, that, that, that takes a while. And there is, I mean, we're talking 20 years difference, which is not huge in, in time spans, but it, it's still something where we are slightly behind. And you mentioned that study at the beginning of McKinsey, where it was clearly shown that in scientific output, if you take institutions in Europe and in the US that rank at, at par, um, and you then have a look at how many patents are created, how many startups are founded, and what's the economic output of these, the, um, then the difference becomes bigger and bigger and bigger as you go from, from the science to, to the output at the very end. And that's basically where we, we try to have our impact in Austria and, and, and close that gap and see that we make best use of the substrate of, of, of science and scientists that are around here, and there is a lot of headroom. Just to add, the well, I mean, one thing is the mindset to start a company, you know, and, and there are people who will do that, but they don't necessarily have the vision to build a big company, 
there are many people who think, well, I'll have my startup on the side. I do want that. But it can stay small. It's my, my hobby company. Um, maybe I employ a few people. And I think that's a bit of the European mentality that this vision, this dream, this big idea is a bit missing. So even people that we've encountered who have some amazing technology, they don't necessarily want to exploit it to its maximum. They're thinking small. At least at the beginning. At the beginning, exactly. When we have continued discussions with them, we try to plant the idea of, well, okay, this is wonderful, but couldn't you make even more out of that? Look at the potential. And sometimes you see a kind of light shining in their eyes and they realize, you're right. And never didn't think out of the box and think that there's a bigger picture and we can really make something transformative out of this. Uh, it's often triggered by the thought, well, there is not so much money available to actually um, drive my plans that, that the person may have. So often it's like, yeah, but with a hundred thousand a year, we, we can't do more than this. And then we have a discussion about turn it around. I mean, develop your, your plan and then calculate in order to realize that plan and get to the next milestone, how much does it cost actually? And then actually look for, for the funding to, to enable that. And uh, that makes, of course, a huge difference if you, if you make plans based on 50 to 100,000, or if you say, well, let's talk about a million or two. And it's like, it opens up opportunities. And, and that's, that's not always present in people's mind that this is actually possible to be a bit less modest and think bigger. Not that they couldn't think bigger, just that often people don't know that they can, that there are so much more resources available um, to them and to, to, to their work. So yeah. that's really important to turn it around, not that's the money I could have and how could I somehow in this modest framework uh, make it happen? But say, that's my plan, that's my bold plan, and that's the money I need. And if the plan is good and reasonable, then the money will be found. Yeah, I agree with that. The, getting the initial direction right is key to success. I mean, the flip the script or plan backwards. When you look at the pharma industry, every business plan starts with two to three billion that's necessary to bring anything to the market. Uh, even in the early stages, uh, it's this uh, backward thinking to say, okay, to bring something to the patient, uh, what do we need? And then how can we uh, dissect the plan into chunks that they risk the progress and also make it adjustable for the first investors and then the following investors. I think there is an abundance, on, I mean, especially in the last years, there's an abundance of capital anyways in the world. I mean, I think uh, the bailout programs sum up to nine to 10 trillion dollars or euros that uh, were just flooding the market and now uh, dripping down, I think, to investors and uh, also have some spillover effects then in the early stage development in a couple of months or years down the road. So I think it's really the right time to put bigger stories on the market. But everything starts with the first step. Everything starts with uh, the, the, the first step, bringing people uh, from this uh, mindset of staying at the institution uh, or at least one of the team towards uh, creating a company. And I ask, I always ask myself the question, what is the right time to, to spin something out or to start working in that direction? Alexander, you said you gave a little bit of hints. Can you go a bit deeper into that topic that you've said in America, everybody's talking all the time, uh, whether they can spin something out or not. Uh, is there a perfect, is there really, or maybe is there a perfect time to do that spin out or is it really an ongoing process? I find it hard to find, to define a, a clear definition of that point. Um, there is obviously a, a too early and a too late. Both is, is possible. I mean, we, we are willing to take risks, technology, technology risks and science risks, but we, we do not want to take a finance, pure science projects where there is still basic research to be done to, um, to prove that, that, that an idea could basically work. Uh, but that's, that's part of, but actually that's part of the discussions we have with the founders um, very often that we think, so what, what is the status of the technology? What is, what is vision? What is already proven? What has, what has been done in experiments? And then the question, how much risk can we as, as a venture capital fund actually bear? Uh, and how much is actually really still in the, in the fields of academic research that needs to be 
de-risked based on, on public money and with research grants, research money. And when is the point where actually the, the much faster development can happen outside of the academic lab in a company that is less asking for um, basic questions, but really uh, is geared then towards an application and, um, and a concrete goal in, in mind. But it's something that needs really to be worked out in the discussion with the founders. Um, they have their perspectives. We can bring in other perspectives. And usually you meet somewhere in between. I mean, it's not, not in the sense of a negotiation, but in the sense of a, of a brainstorming and figure out what's the, what's the best way. And sometimes, I mean, we have cases where our discussion start and the investment happened one or two years later. So, um, And I think sometimes those questions of timing relate to the technology and the maturity of it. And sometimes it comes down to the people, you know, when, when are the people ready to step out? When are the people at a point in their career where they're, where they're ready to make that move? And so, as you said, I mean, every case is kind of unique and is a discussion. Um, there's, no, there's no general rule, but my overall impression is that in some cases, people wait longer than necessary. They do probably more in the academic setting than is strictly necessary in order to um, launch a company. So the proof of concept that would be adequate for a company maybe has already been achieved, but the tendency I think among researchers is that everything should be perfect and everything pinned down and confirmed a hundred times. Now that may not be necessary in each case. Let's talk a little bit about the hurdles to overcome uh, when spinning out technology plus the team that belongs to the technology into a noble company. Uh, I give you a few stories from what I experienced in the last 15 years and uh, especially when talking to institutions or universities. Um, I had at the beginning of my career, I had the, the luck to work with companies who already had done deals or spin out deals. And I, I knew the deal structures that in my opinion work and also can find follow on investors. And I thought this is, this is the world out there. It consists only of that. Uh, of course, it was just one or two deals. So it's not statistically relevant. Uh, and I saw a different world. So. For example, one story was that, um, someone read in the newspaper that, uh, similar technology to what he was developing uh, got uh, a deal with a pharma company of 1 billion euros. So his opinion was his early stage technology was, was basically a patent is worth 1 billion. Uh, another blocking stone that I experienced was that the institution who wanted to spin out something uh, considered it a good deal um, when for bringing in the patents uh, into the startup um, into the startup company, that the institution gets 90% equity and the founding uh, uh, startup uh, uh, members get 10% the remaining part. Uh, in my opinion, these are very, very difficult structures to, to place on the market and uh, turn into something uh, that is prospering. It has a chance to, to, to slowly grow and then prosper into a larger institution or company. What's your perception of uh, this, this field of uh, academia, academia, academic tech transfer and bringing these technologies that are necessary to make the company <laughs> thrive and start? Uh, into this area, what did you see on the market and what does work for you? Um, yeah, I mean, clearly very different worlds and that's what it comes down to. Fundamentally, the problem that people don't know enough and are a bit fearful of what they don't know. A sort of fear of missing out, a fear of being exploited. Um, and what you mentioned about, you know, somebody thinking their contribution is worth more than it is actually worth in commercial terms. I think that can be overcome in part with education. That's really about explaining things and sitting down with somebody and explaining how, how things work. Most founders we've come across do see the light. If you sit down and explain why something is not workable, they, they get there. Perhaps a bit more tricky is the question of, you know, dealing with some institutions because Again, there is a fear-based sort of situation where 
the worry is that, you know, this will become a unicorn and, you know, somebody's going to make a lot of money out of this. And if we as an institution don't get in early and demand a lot, we'll be left out. And then people will ask questions about why we, why we gave something away almost for free. And again, a bit of an education thing to explain, you know, really what, what's workable for startups and what's workable for subsequent investors, because the company is going to go nowhere if it doesn't get those investments. So I see a, a problem and we see this regularly and we try to sometimes mediate and support both sides really in reaching an understanding of the issues. And I think it's something which will get better with time because as people get more familiar with dealing with spin outs from their institutions and they see other professors spinning out and talk to them and see what the reality is of starting a company, I think these issues will slowly become less and less of a problem. But in isolated cases, I think we'll still have to go in and explain things to people just to make clear that there is the, the theory and then there is the reality. I mean, both cases that you mentioned, uh, fortunately, we have never come across such extremes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, But both reflect still something that we see sometimes that is the, the, the idea that the, the basic value of a company lies in the initial IP, the initial kind of idea and, and a eureka moment. Uh, but in fact, this is just a, a, a small contribution to the success at the very end. So, so often um, something pivots and more, more IP comes to play plus so much work. So the initial IP is the, is the starting point, but it's certainly not a billion or 90% of the value of a company, but it's a, it's a small contribution to getting it started. It's a critical contribution, but people need to get an understanding that this is certainly not 90%. But as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not a case that we encountered so far, but a bit of tendency is there to overvalue the initial IP. And what we do sometimes encounter is um, company valuations at founding, which are really off the scale. Um, which makes it very difficult for investors to come in, you know, so um, not everybody really understands what is a fair valuation, even within a, a broad range for their type of company. They, as you say, they've, they've been inspired by stories they've read or um, calculate in strange ways exactly why they think a company is worth what it's, what they think it's worth. And sometimes again, there's a discussion over that, point precisely so that we can get an alignment and you know see both sides of the story yeah i agree alexander to what you said and ingrid uh, i picked the most extreme cases that i experienced in the last 15 years to spark up the discussion uh it is not it was also not the matter of uh, the norm uh, i also think that the the understanding got a lot better uh across europe uh what a successful startup story needs initially uh, term-wise to move forward. Uh, also, this valuation, I think, is something that can can be overcome uh, when talking to people and uh, reasoning with them and uh, come back with comparable deals or also look on the market. Um, what's possible later on as an exit story, like uh, IPOs or selling it to pharma. There are enough examples on the market already, luckily. It's better than 15 years ago. Um, I think a lot of uh, these uh, challenges can easily be overcome when um, a founder gets some sort of advisory report or some advisors that he can can tap into uh, whenever a problem occurs to just get the right information at the right time. What is your perception in the ecosystem here in Europe and in Austria? Do we have enough role models on the market um, that can act as mentors uh, for founders or is there still um, a gap to be filled? Field. It's it's not enough yet. I mean, we talked about it. This is still we are not there where the US was twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have an abundance of role models, but we still have a number of people that have done it before. And on individual decision, the individual um, uh, experiences we have it within within the, the ecosystem. Absolutely. I mean, we have now a, a portfolio of eleven companies. And the, the amount of exchange that we see between among these people is already quite impressive because somebody made one experience, didn't overcome a certain problem. And when they are sharing that, 
this this adds a lot of value already for each other. So we don't have to to look around for for kind of the role models that that have done it a hundred times and know everything, but it's also about creating the necessary links within the existing network to make sure that the information that is there, the experiences that have been made become accessible to the others. That requires, of course, a certain amount of trust and, and knowledge who is who and, and interlinking the, the, the players in, in that system. And that overcomes to some extent the size of the, of the ecosystem. So a smaller but well-networked and maybe well, not curated is maybe too strong as a word, but if there are certain intermediate people that that can make links and that uh, where where A trusts B and and C trusts B, then B can bring A and C together, and they can have a, a trust from uh, exchange. We can help each other. And that's something we see quite often actually happening. And in Europe, we don't, probably don't do enough of that. You know, leveraging our networks and just reaching out to people. Yeah. Um, Americans seem to do that much better where they don't hesitate. Maybe it's a bit less hierarchical. And so people will just reach out when they need help. And Europeans and maybe researchers in particular tend to not feel comfortable doing so. It doesn't feel right. So they could actually make more use of the networks that they do have. And you know, with time, those networks can grow, but only if you actually work those networks. So one thing we do work with researchers is really encouraging them to, you know, just contact that person or talk to person A who we know knows person B and can make an introduction. Even little things like that can, can really lead to breakthroughs where you can find um, a new advisor for the board or, or some kind of useful professional links. And the important part is to also not to think just Austria in that. I mean, we have cases where the, the right person, just the right person to advise uh, about a go-to-market strategy, a product definition was far away from Austria, but in the US or, or somewhere else. So it's we don't have to always think about the Austrian ecosystem, but it's making those long range hops in a network and, and find the right person at a company somewhere or the, the former executive somewhere. And that's that's an important part that we play actually uh, by a, finding those people, but also raising the bar a lot with the startups to say, let's let's reach really for the stars here. And let's find that perfect person for you that can make the real difference. Not just somebody who is quite good and had made some experience and can help you, but somebody who's just the right thing. So raising the bar really very much. And if you find this person, and we can't promise to do that all together in all the cases, but then it really can make a big difference for the startup. Let's stay a little bit with these role models, mentors, and expert advisors. I agree uh, to your point, Alexander and Ingrid, that uh, finding the stars in the company is, especially in the early stages, is key to success because they already bring a lot of uh, know-how and knowledge into the company and help to create uh, the right direction. In my opinion, when companies operate out of Austria initially, so it's started in Austria, uh, there's a high chance. I mean, Austria is a small country, 8 million inhabitants, a little bit more, nine, close to nine now. Um, so the likelihood of finding the star just rounds the corner in a very narrow scientific field initially is next to impossible, in my opinion. It might happen. But most of the time it may, may not. So the next search area then is Europe, where it's really easy to 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 argue that um, mm -hmm. say okay come come to Austria or relocate to Austria and this is this is an uh, easy shot. When I look at the reality of companies initially, in my opinion, these are, are network companies or that are virtual companies uh, with the initial setup because very often the star is in Japan or is in China or it's in Australia or uh, at, in the United States. So for me, it's, it doesn't matter. So we can have a nice phone call. It doesn't matter if this person is um, um, somewhere overseas, but I learned that it does matter for the local community. So it's uh, the perception of a virtual setup initially, it must not stay that, uh, is sometimes very challenging uh, to explain because the traditional corporate model that uh, would, would say 99% of uh, foundations bring to the table is 
just uh, found a company, hire your team, bring them into one building, into one place and make them grow. Uh, whereas when I look at science, where we need the stars on board, uh, very often I see this virtual setup initially that we say, okay, we have five people who are really the best in the field. Uh, but in the initially they start working out of Germany, yeah. out of Austria, out of the United States, or out of South America. And this stays that way for two to three years. Uh, did you perceive any of those challenges in your work or um, is that uh, something that's... Uh, unique to me. So maybe to make it precise, what I mentioned at the big, just before about finding the right person, this was, I was more thinking about advisors who helped him on certain guiding guideposts and guidelines or ideas and then also commercial um, points or also scientific maybe. But when we really talk about the teams that work here on site or with, with the teams, uh, I think we have the huge advantage that Austria has people that are extremely well educated. I and mean, we have, uh, we can, the, the, the startups can actually fish in a pond of very well educated people. Plus, the mobility of people in Europe uh, increased quite a bit. I, I mean, I don't have statistics for that, but I can look at the uh, roughly 100 people that work with in the, the startups that we work with. And there we have a high number of people that moved to Austria from other countries, uh, from India, from, from Russia, from all over the place, actually. And because we see that very good academic groups attract talent from all over the world. And some of these, again, um, work then with startups. So um, the, the, the recruiting pool goes definitely beyond the Austrian borders. Um, and of this, of, although we have a large number of excellent people here, the startups can actually also attract beyond the borders. And this is actually great to see that this works. I mean, this shows that Austria is an attractive place to, to do research, to work, and is competitive. So in this war for talent, Austria can compete, actually. And our startups prove that. And they make use of that fact. And it has to be said that, you know, most of the startups that we look at and that we have in our portfolio are in a phase where they're really doing intensive R&D. So they're not super lean, virtual, you know, transatlantic entities. They're really a core function where there's a lot of hands-on work being done in a small team where I think daily communication is, is, is really critical. It's not to say that somebody can't be somewhere else and come to some arrangement, but I think at the very early stages, the typical thing is your core team is present in one physical location. Um, and maybe then at a later stage, the arrangement can be more flexible and, and change. And of course, certain functions you do outsource at the beginning. I mean, you don't build uh, a preclinical facility uh, if you're full-fledged, if you just need a few preclinical experiments or a regulatory department, if you need initial um, uh, guidance on how to, how to design a clinical study or something like that. So certain things are outsourced and that makes a lot of sense. But luckily, these, these functions exist nowadays and, and the startups make smart use of that. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. Maybe also a little bit the the ecosystem changed to uh, spin out earlier ideas than uh, two decades ago, where maybe the the ideas stayed a little bit longer at the institutions. Um, let's stay a little bit with your uh, portfolio that you currently have uh, in your fund. What? How does the the typical startup for ISD Cube look like uh, when we look at the business models? Uh, is it so typical B2B models that uh, generate revenues very quickly or is it going uh, more on uh, capital intensive uh, research that uh, is are set up for longer term and generate cash flows uh, in one or two decades? How is uh, the current typical startup story looking like when ISD Cube comes on board? I would say that we're, we approach this the investment decisions in the knowledge that any tech which is truly going to transform an industry, it needs time. I mean, we're 
a quick fix is not really what we're looking for. We're looking for things which need time to mature, to develop, to gain traction and so on. So we invest on that kind of time horizon. Um, we want steady progress, but we don't expect revenues within two to three years of investing. I and mean, that's mostly impractical. Um, we don't have a specific rule about whether it's B2B or B2C or B2B2C or whatever. Um, it depends a bit on the particular technology and, and the field. But there's certainly an expectation on our side that the company will be mainly seeking to fund itself through investments for the foreseeable future and not through revenue generation. Yeah. And it, it can even be, and we have seen it too, that uh, companies, startups uh, have the opportunity to earn some money, create some revenue with a collaboration with the industry. But they also have to ask themselves then, is this re is this just for the money or does it really help them towards the ultimate goal? Is it a distraction or is it helping them because they build relationships and because they learn indirect interaction with industry? That's a very important dis distinction to make. And just because there is revenues doesn't mean they, they are healthy and helpful revenues. Uh, and they, in any case, in most cases, they will not be sufficient to fund significant part of the research that's necessary. So in many cases, it's actually better not to, to pursue them. It's at least important to, to always make the test if it's really helpful or not. That's, that's very interesting. I would like to add another question to that. Um, um, I, from what I understood from what you were saying is that you are looking for long-range visionary projects uh, that really change something significant in the world uh, to move forward and you're not so much looking for um, um, quick to cash flows set up so that you have an exit in 6 to 12 months or 18 months uh, so you're going for the longer range. When I look at the simplistic uh, uh, picture of the world, uh, I, I would dissect it into two two ways, uh, which come back then to mindset. So one is the European way, which is very product oriented, uh, quick to cash flows, um, and uh, uh, basically simplistic. We produce something, uh, focus on that one product, and sell it or bring it to the market. Whereas when I look at uh, the US storytelling, uh, my perception is it's much more visionary. So it's much more emphasizing what they would like to change the world. Just thinking about, uh, as it was in the news yesterday, Facebook, for example, initially it was the idea of uh, changing the way people communicate globally at zero expenses, which was really something game changing. Or uh, Jeff Bezos, who wanted to remodel uh, logistics and the way uh, goods are delivered to people initially back in the in the 90s, starting with uh, with books. How do you see the the attitude uh, within the startup sector in Europe uh, when we look at these two two past role models do they still exist in that way or uh, are these um, two role models coming closer together? I mean, every every founder starts that we work with start with a vision, yeah, um, and usually they are not small. I mean. There may be in many cases less abstract uh, than in the cases that you just mentioned, like changing the ways people communicate and the incremental cost should be zero and such stuff. Um, but they have visions that are pretty big in their field, like opening up a complete new field of, uh, of drug targets, for instance, mm -hmm. that could be the breeding ground for like, a large number of blockbuster drugs. Uh, make uh, make uh, receptors druggable that haven't been there before. I mean, this is a grand vision too. We don't always have to refer to the um, ultra unicorns in the US that everybody has on top of their mind, but in fact are great outliers essentially. And if we just had them and nothing else in the world, the world would look pretty dire actually. So there is there is there is plenty of big visions that are big enough to really make a lot of sense for everyone, investors, founders, and, and society. So I, I'd rather move away a little bit and say, what, are, what is a big enough vision? There is lots of big visions in different areas, and there's lots of innovation headroom. And if you look about logistics, energy, computer science, privacy, drug development, materials, 
all these fields hold a lot of upside and each of these fields have so many so many space for for new ideas and great Actually, universities are kind of breeding grounds for those bigger visions. Um, you know, we, we don't tend to see university founders who come with an idea for a product that's going to make them a fortune in six to 12 months. I mean, they're coming with this maybe naive view of the world saying, you know, I want to make a difference. What I'm working on in the lab could really make a difference to some field or other and make people's lives better or whatever. And I want to see that implemented because I want to make a positive impact on the world. And so I don't see any shortage of vision within at least a specified area um, that is familiar to the researcher. Um, and, and I think there are people, of course, who do invest in the product-based companies and there are plenty of them out there, but that's not really our field of focus. I mean, we're really looking for the cases, like you mentioned, where there's, it starts with an idea, And then it's more about implementation of the idea rather than the idea of we know what the end product is and we're going to just roll it out. And I could imagine in some cases, the vision, the aftermath, when everything went well, was like, let's make the world a healthier place. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, this is always something that... Uh, That is very nice. Let's look a little bit uh, at the ecosystem. IST Cube is not only operating, uh, I think, uh, as a single entity, uh, not connected to the rest of the world. Uh, you have built a profound ecosystem over the last let me say, five years. I think 2017 was the founding part. Can you shine a little bit uh, of light on your ecosystem? So what, what else than capital is IST Cube? bringing to the table beyond the seed financing. So it's uh, there's always a, a life beyond seed financing. And as far as I understand your setup, uh, ISD Cube is uh, not the fund that uh, takes the entire amount up to the end point of the company. Uh, you work with, you already mentioned it, work with syndicates and with other organizations. Can you explain a little bit more how it looks like? Yeah, so we, we really try not to be the only one that, that wouldn't help anyone. So we, our operating base, uh, very practically speaking, is here in, at, at the campus of ISD Park. So part of the ecosystem, when we talk about physical, so to say, is ISD Park is a tech park with infrastructure, with chem chemistry and biology labs that are accessible to, to the startups. The vicinity to ISD Austria with all the intellectual capital and infrastructure that is in part accessible to, to startups. Then the fund, then all the people within the profession work with each other. That's kind of the, the, the immediate ecosystem. Uh, and when we try to, to help them, well, we, we try to open up our networks as good as we can and to create, a, I would say, an atmosphere of, of sharing where we are very much believe that we are not in competition with each other here. Not at all. I mean, there is Austria and there is the whole rest of the world. So the competition is somewhere else. And the likelihood that two Austrian companies actually competing, I mean, it's very unlikely. So it makes a lot of sense that we all help each other to make the best out of what's happening. And, and what do we do then basically? I mean, we, we take only a small share of the companies. Our investments are um, uh, in the range of 10% plus minus equity of, of, a, of, a, of a company. And it's necessary that the founders remain in the driver's seat for a long time. And they are at the end those that make the success or not for the company. So they need to be motivated. They need to have a good um, result at the end. They get diluted anyhow. So we, we try to keep our own share uh, at a level that makes that successful exit for the founders also possible at the end. And we, we work with them on, on various fronts. I mean, when it comes to, to the Daily, daily things at the beginning, the how to select a, a tax accountant to um, many, many of the, the, the practicalities, but then the hiring decisions, we try to be helpful there. Uh, on IP questions, on the discussion with the, with a licensing institution of IP. Well, there are many areas where we lean in and where we substitute to some extent by what, what in, in more mature ecosystems uh, people would just find from, from, street, from, from, from people they know anyhow. So we try to kind of 
concentrate the not so large ecosystem have to a, something that has a higher density and and placed in a similar function as a larger not so dense network. I think the the innovation ecosystem overall in Austria is actually not tiny. I mean, there are a lot of players. Um, each performing a useful role, um, whether it's enabling or, or actual founding or uh, encouraging people to, to go ahead and do innovative research and so on. So we are, see ourselves as partners in this. You know, we want to um, help people find their way through this ecosystem, which is not always easy. I mean, the navigation, I think, is one of the difficulties. But there are a lot of people out there who have knowledge, who have money who have expertise to be tapped into and if we can help people to navigate that system better we're giving them i think a huge boost at a time when everything's rather strange and not known yeah. to them because there really there is this, this chain of events or chain of players from from academic idea to business there is the, the, the universities there's the tech transfer offices there are the grant agencies there is the APU Space Centers and, and, and similar institutions. There is financing uh, bodies like, like, like us and so on. And, and all those are actually contributing a critical role in this transition from idea to successful business. And they're in no way competitors in this, in this chain of events. They are rather parts of, of this chain. And I think it's important that everybody has this mindset, actually, to work together and to enable that transition from step to step. And uh, we have many of these functions, support functions in Austria, more than in many other countries. But as Ingrid mentioned, it's not easy to get an overview of what's there for a founder who was just in the lab before and now needs to navigate that system to make best use of it. And it can be extremely helpful, but you need to know to find a way and you need to be, you need to know it's there. And also within those institutions, it makes sense to, to share and also there to um, create criticality in its in size and, and not try to have many, many silos, but be, be transparent as good as possible. Yeah, I completely agree with that. A startup is always a collaborative work of the, the, the local or the European ecosystem. Uh, and many things must play together. When I try to emphasize with founders and just imagine how the world looks to them, I mean, the typical scientific founder uh, usually went to school, then to university, got these days the bachelor, uh, master, some sort of master's degree, PhD, uh, does some postdoc work or becomes a university professor. So it's uh, a whole academic career. And I think uh, the personality then is very much shaped to succeed in academia. And... As it might happen, uh, like when it, let's just think about uh, gene editing, for example. Some ideas might qualify then uh, to be commercialized, and they also think there is more and more pressure on academics uh, to commercialize the idea also in Europe. But this is an entire new world. And uh, I think all the, the success criteria and all the, the habits uh, academics learned at academia, then suddenly when they do it for the first time, don't apply anymore in this business world or are not so helpful anymore in this business world. And when I think a, a little bit further to the hardcore finance guys, uh, usually they expect uh, um, um, a finalized story to invest in. So where team is in place, where the organization is in place and the business plan is written and we have a clear perspective towards an exit uh, with a lot of clarity and uh, limited uncertainty. So I get also what you said, the safety is also something that is highly regarded in finance. Um, and as far as I understand you from this conversation, uh, IST Cube is exactly operating in that space that might look very confusing initially to academics who start a company the first time and offer uh, a lot more than just deploying capital into a company and then let the people run away. Did they get the right uh, perception of, uh, of your setup? Yeah, I mean, the, the beautiful thing is that scientists are very smart people. Mm. So um, it's not that this is without reach for them, not at all. I mean, you they're extremely quick to pick up things. So it just takes some, some impulse and some direction and, and, and then they learn and then they know. Absolutely. Um, but, it, but it still takes somebody to, 
to enable them to make this transition. And they would make it probably also without our help, but it could happen that it takes longer or some some mistakes happen on the way that could be avoided if they had somebody on their side to help them. Uh, but yes, that's what we do. I mean, we, we bridge that gap. We have been, almost the whole team has been in science before mm -hmm. and then gained experience in, in finance, in law, in, in, in consulting in business. So we, we also experience it ourselves how it is as a scientist to be exposed to financial terms or uh, to business thinking and how strange it was at the beginning if somebody told you you're, you're very academic in your thinking. And I thought, what's bad about that? Uh, <laughs> now I know what was meant when that was said to me, uh, why it is not always only positive, but it has also difficulties. And we, we play that role and I think we, we also understand um, the, the transition, plus we like the science. And I think most of us, no, no not most, all of us like to be around scientists. So um, that, that's part of it and part of the fun actually working this in this job. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a fund, but we're also a group of individuals. And the reason that we like doing this job is because it gives us a personal satisfaction to work with these startups. And the projects that we, the companies that we invest in, we have to feel a certain passion about them because we devote actually a huge amount of energy and enthusiasm into any company that we invest in to accompany them effectively on this journey. So we have to have a sort of personal buy-in to the whole vision and to the team and, and all the rest. So we're really in the sense like external members of, of the core team in terms of what we contribute. And we, I think I personally feel that anything positive that happens with a company is something that reflects our contribution as well and it gives me a great deal of pleasure I agree. we were talking uh, a lot about the actual state uh, and what what isd cube is doing let's uh brainstorm a little bit uh about the future of um of early stage investments here in europe um do we already have a perfect world here in europe so i mean we have uh success stories like for example i mean uh, in pharma a long time was missing this big hit that also attracted uh, in, in, uh, people and investors outside Europe. Now we have the big hit, big hit with BioNTech, for example. Uh, we have also, I think, other, in other areas, great stories that moved forward and that can uh, serve as a North Star. Uh, are we already done with developing the ecosystem here in Europe or do you see a uh, few points that uh, need improvement further in the coming 10 years? I think we're just at the beginning. I think this is, um, we're heading in a positive direction, but mm -hmm. we're, this is baby steps. And I think we have a long way to go. Um, and in part, I think what, what we're, again, it goes back to this idea of the bigger vision. You know, we, we there's no reason why we can't be building, um, you know, serious heavyweights in the life sciences industries that will not necessarily just be a target for acquisition, but will be standalone, long-term sustainable businesses. And I think we need that. You know, we have we have some big pharma, we have some smaller biotechs, um, and people like BioNTech hopefully are, are going to survive and, and prosper. But in a way, we're we're missing a bit these newer companies coming up behind, which grow and, and attain a critical mass, and then really make a, a long term contribution to kind of the European life sciences scene. And not only life science, but also in other areas. I mean, we and we see it's going. It's going to happen. And we see in the case, in the example of IST Austria, what can be achieved in a short period of time if the if the structure is right, if the the, the planning is, is is well done. And we we see companies in Vienna that are extremely successful. I mean, if you also in other areas, if you think about TT Tech as a spin off from mm. from TU Wien, I mean. World leading company, a few thousand people working there. Um, so there are examples and there will be more. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree to that. But still, very often I get the, the impression that uh, the grass is green in Silicon Valley, <laughs> for example. Um, what, what, in your opinion, uh, 
would be the 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 next step for the uh, Austrian or European uh, ecosystem to to move towards that direction? Are we already there? Uh, do we have? Uh, are we already set up to to grow over time? I think we're missing numbers. You know, not all startups are going to survive or should survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a huge range from really really good ones to ones that maybe shouldn't have been founded in the first place. But of course, if you don't have a pool to select from and to invest in, then there are not many opportunities to grow really, really good companies. So I, I think it's partly a numbers game. We, we need to get more people thinking of founding. We need to get better at identifying technologies that really have potential and start exploiting that potential as soon as possible and not just waiting for somebody in Silicon Valley to pick them up. I think this this point. I mean, um, uh, to emphasize that failure culture is something that I hear very often here in in Austria. That uh, we like a little bit of failure culture. Do you think this is might be a blocking stone for some people? Still, in my opinion, I mean, starting a startup means uh, nine out of ten cases won't work. It's not uh, a mistake or something uh, messed something up. It's just natural part of the process. How do you perceive this term failure culture? And uh, might this be something that blocks people to to go out and say, okay, let's do it? Possibly. It was, that was more of a problem in the past, I believe, than now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember one of one of the founders we invited for, for giving a talk here, who reflected upon his own career from from being a scientist to becoming an entrepreneur and then having an exit actually. He said, well, if I look back now, what's pro and what's contra of a startup, so it's, I mean, the risk you're taking is actually very low. I mean, you're investing your time, maybe a little bit of own money. You gain a lot of experience. You can get a, on a learning curve like nowhere else. Um, if it works, you are extremely well off. So there's a lot of things on the positive side. Well, if it doesn't happen, well, you may have lost two years or three years of where you didn't make a, a higher salary in in a, in, a, in a corporate setting, but the difference is not making the world change, personal world, and and you 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 earn so much more in terms of experience and, and interest to your CV. It's unbeatable in his words. So, so for him, it was clear that even if it would not have worked out, and at that point it has had not worked out yet. Um, he he saw it as a very very positive development, and I think uh, the balance is on the, definitely on trying that that route. It's it's a it's a lifetime experience. It's not always easy. Clearly, it's very intense, um, but it's something to. I think there is not no problem to not be to fail. And I was almost a, almost looking for a different word than fail, but it's it's not a failure. I mean, there is inherent risk in doing those things and it's not just up to you and if it does not become a big success it's not necessarily a failure or a personal fa uh, failure um, it's important to separate the personality and, and the, 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 the individuals from when it does not happen to be a success and it's important to recognize it as also as, a, as an individual as well as a society that it's great to 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 try it and uh, if it's not happening the first time maybe the second time or but it's it's not tainting anybody anymore yeah, i agree with that you can, it's something that people can do again as a startup as a process not an outcome i think failure the, the end result when it didn't work is an outcome uh whereas uh the process of starting a company growing a company building a company it's it's, it's a process and when people did it one time to go through that process, they can do it quicker and with less friction in the uh, second time. And then they maybe see this, what's regarded as the big success, which basically is almost always these days the exit perspective. What's your perception on uh, uh, on, on this, this exit term? I very often uh, talk with founders and they have a clear perspective towards exiting as a founder, whereas uh, I rather see, as you mentioned at the beginning, I see um, these um, uh, longer term stories. Uh, how do you see some trends with founders that say, okay, uh, we, we create companies for exiting quickly? Is that something uh, that you, you, you perceive as sustainable? It's interesting because I don't think exit is ever anything on anybody's mind when we have these discussions with, with founders at a very mm -hmm. early stage. I mean, they probably don't even really know what we mean by the term. 
because I think they're not really necessarily thinking about money at all. As I say, there are different motivations. Um, they might hope that, yeah, that they will they will make some money at the end. But in terms of the concept of an exit, I think is is a bit alien to them. So no, I would say it's rare that that we have anybody who has preconceived ideas about how to do that, which is a good thing because an exit can take so many different forms and it's a bad idea, I think, to go in having a very, very fixed and clear idea of how that should look down the road. Yeah, I mean, it's I fully I can only subscribe to that. They have a vision for what they want to realize, what they want to achieve. Of course, that, that somewhere in the back of the mind, if it works out, they will be well off. But it's not it's not the governing thought or theme at all. It's really getting it done, making it happen, and and of course there is a, when it comes to valuation discussions, they want to have a fair deal. Uh, mm. That's it. But it's it's not the, the primary thing, and and an exit is so far away to, in, in those fields that we are active in. Not not a major thing. And if somebody was just eyeing on that. Uh, in the first year of something that takes 10 years, um, probably it wouldn't be a good idea to to team up then. That's true. At first, the first time I heard exit uh, was when I started in the life science industry with this Novartis spin out. Uh, before it was always um, uh, with great companies that last. Um, but to get uh, SD Cube into the right uh, pocket of uh, people's mind, uh, you are not a philanthropic uh, entity. So in the end of the day, uh, I think also, uh, did I get something wrong? Also, you expect that uh, money that you invest uh, ideally should flow back to ISTQ. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are not only to us, but to our investors and mm -hmm. our LPs. So we are not a philanthropic organization. We are here for the, for the sake of making money for our investors. But on the way, we want to do work with good companies that deliver something that's of value to society. So maybe in that sense, somewhat philanthropic that we want to, to enable good things, but really every company that works with us is expected to make money. And we want, we need to make money in, with our investments in them. So that's, that's why we look not only at what's the, what's in for society, but what's in also from an economic term. And it's important that we also, in that way of thinking, bring them on a different path, those researchers that, is, that are trained to, think in terms of grand milestones to the next milestone to into the world of equity thinking where money needs to be productive and needs to grow essentially. Otherwise there is no company or no product. It's not sustainable. So definitely in that. So in, from in the, in the classical sense, we are definitely not philanthropic. We are not a grant agency. We are in as a, as a venture, as a venture fund that needs to make money. And if the startups are successful, then we are successful too. So that goes hand in hand. It does mean that we can't invest in all startups. I mean, there has to be at least a, a credible path to a high return um, because this is a high risk business, right? So we, we don't expect that inevitably every company we invest in is going to be incredibly successful, but we do need some of them to be very, very good in what they do. So we wouldn't invest, for instance, in a, in a company that had relatively modest ambitions to deliver a service, perhaps where the growth trajectory is, is going to be correspondingly modest. And we, we really have to bear in mind that the mission that we have for our investors is to identify, if possible, those companies that will have not just a small growth trajectory, but something really quite remarkable yeah our mission is to enable things that are really big uh, that does not mean that if we do not support a, a certain startup that it is necessarily bad not at all but maybe it's just not fitting to a model of a vc um, and it can be a very nice business by itself but it doesn't necessarily fit to what we are looking for so we are really looking for things that have the potential to be really big could you, I mean, this, uh, this fit, what is the model uh, that fits with a VC? Could you give four or five cornerstones so that people who listen to the podcast can, can imagine what's uh, in the startup, what is the VC model and what not? I mean, it requires a market that is really large. I mean, if, 
if if the outlook is that the startup, if it's successful, will deliver revenue of, of five million or ten million or even twenty million uh, at its theoretical max, then this is not a VC case. There needs to be the outlook that if everything works out well, that um, the value of that company at some point could be hundreds of million. Um, so we are really talking about orders of magnitude here. So, in, and as I mentioned in the beginning, there's many companies that will not achieve that size by in principle, but still have a reason why they should be there, but not, they don't fall within our field of activities then. The company should also have a kind of scalable business model so that their growth is not driven by the numbers of people employed by the company. So it's not just a manpower issue that you can do more of whatever if you have more people, but really something where an injection of cash maybe can make things so much more efficient or be so transformative that it generates something of value that goes beyond the number of people in the company. Yeah. Or that are so okay. What's also bad from in our model is if it's only scalable with lots of lots of more investments because you need to build factories um, or machinery. So if it only scales with the amount of money you put into, that wouldn't work either. But if you develop a drug and the drug gets to the market and it addresses um, an important need, then this would be a case. Yeah, I think drug development is nice as an area because it has a clear point of uh, handover to pharma, uh, which is uh, uh, structured by uh, the regulatory framework, which is very unique. It's maybe not so clear in other industries. Or if you if you develop a new technology in, in photonics, for instance, that enables 3D displays, um, then this technology would be extremely valuable to the big producers of displays. That would be a case too. You don't have to build plants. Uh, and start producing, but you can hand over this technology to people that have these infrastructures already and earn money on, 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 the, on the back of those players, licensing revenues, for instance. No, I think this is a key what you're saying. Um, there are many nice uh, business models in the world that work and that are possible also in, in life science or other industries uh, that are not VC cases. So because VCs don't invest doesn't mean that uh, the business model cannot be validated and doesn't work. Uh, VCs operate in a very, very narrow space that is uh, uh, betting on the next generation of game-changing technology uh, that... Uh, can have a huge impact, but uh, uh, as you said in the talk, um, the economy is not only defined by a few companies. Uh, there are much more uh, possibilities out there than uh, these, these few big companies that uh, very often pop up in my mind when I talk about the economy um, than these companies cover. Uh, Alexander, Ingrid, one final question to you. So um, let's go a little bit back uh, to, to the founders, to the scientific founders. And let's just imagine that uh, you pump into a few founders um, during a conference. Hopefully we can have conferences in person uh, again pretty soon. And uh, you don't have a lot of time, but uh, the founders would like to have one single advice. Uh, and they ask you at this conference, um, I have now an idea and what is the first step that I should think about when I head in the direction of creating a startup? What is the most important first step that you would recommend to these founders? And, um, uh, write an outline of what your idea is and, and, and present it to somebody like us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's talk to people. Get yeah. as much input as you can from people that you respect Preferably from different perspectives, from different industries, from different backgrounds, and really try to refine that idea a bit, um, think things through, develop that plan. Um, doesn't have to be a you know something perfectly polished or anything, but really have the outline of something which you can then really use as basis for a discussion with people like us yeah. and others. But talk to people. 
that's great advice. So uh, assuming that maybe one or the other founder writes that outline, uh, I hope you agree that I give your LinkedIn coordinates in the description to the podcast <laughs> and that people can directly um, reach out to you and hopefully grow together with your support into a prospering future. Alexander, Ingrid, thank you very much for your time and for this insightful uh, talk about ISD Cube and uh, how you built your ecosystem here in Austria. Thank, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Christian. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.